This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. All right, Brian, if you want to give me a hand getting the bag, and I'll hold the painting as we kind of slide it out. It's always kind of nerve-wracking when painting comes in in a, a garbage bag. For sure. <laughs> but in this case, I understand why uh, you brought it in in the garbage bag. Mold, right? That's right, yeah, right. from a hurricane. So tell me about that. My parents uh, lived in Southwest Florida, you know, had a hurricane go through their house. And, and this was Ian, right? Hurricane Ian. Right. Uh, 12 feet of water went through the house. All the furnishings, everything, everything was on, with a, on its yeah. back and on the floor. And, uh, you know, this painting luckily survived in this condition. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can see, it needs significant uh, treatment from you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's putting it lightly. So the painting was in the home, exposed to all of the floodwaters, all of the, the house debris, and then were you able or, or somebody able to get in immediately or no. what happened? Yeah, so this was uh, on, a, on a barrier island and oh, uh, yeah. the, br the bridges were down uh, for multiple weeks. So I think it was uh, three to four weeks before we were even able to access the house. And uh, yeah, mold was everywhere, nice. um, particularly the leather furniture. Was there anything so, saved so the houses the neighborhood? Were, yeah, the houses were physically there, most of them, I should say. There's some that were completely gone, but most of the houses were still physically there. And, uh, they found this one uh, sort of uh, at, an, at an angle in, in, in the back of the house uh, with obviously lots of mold on it. Um, I, I mean, I, I cleaned the mold off the frame, but I didn't touch uh, the canvas at all because of the condition that it's in. <laughs> yeah, you really can't touch it. And, and this painting has a particular importance to you, right? It does. This is a painting by Walter Lofthouse Dean. Uh, he's my great-great-grandfather's brother. Uh, and uh, he was born in 1854, died in 1912 at a relatively early age. Uh, also, uh, you know, r relating a bit to him being out on the sea, catching pneumonia and, and, and dying at a young age, unfortunately. And so he was mostly a maritime painter, correct? That's right, yeah. And um, one of the newspapers at the time called him the foremost mar maritime, ma maritime painter at the, of oh, the that's time. that's interesting. At a time when Winslow Homer and other really famous American artists were yeah were, were painting so. yeah I mean you wonder if he would have ever thought that the thing that he loved so much you know the ocean the sea would become ironically the thing that would take his paintings away uh, yeah. I mean it's a it's a cruel twist but um, well and this this future casting from from history is is obviously a troubling thing with climate change right we don't know what we're in for and the, the house that this was in it went 40 years without a hurricane. I mean, 40 years on this island, didn't have a hurricane at all. And then, you know, in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, there's been hurricane after hurricane, and, and obviously this was the, the biggest one yet. As I understand from our past conversations, you actually have quite a bit of experience talking about and dealing with climate change in your professional role, correct? That's right. I'm the head of energy efficiency and the head of the Cooling for All program, interestingly, uh, when it comes to climate change. Okay. This hurricane obviously happened just before uh, the recent uh, climate change hearings that I was in in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt and progress was made but still not quite enough and right. uh, you know certainly we we need to do a lot more on our energy uh, being more efficient uh, using renewables and and that's that's the field that I work in is is driving for more efficient sustainable energy gotcha right so d something that's directly related to what ended up causing the damage on this painting and you know in conservation we have 10 agents of deterioration and uh, those are physical forces you know traumas things that happen to paintings uh, vandals uh, thieves displacers people who do bad things to paintings um, we talk about fire water pollutants um, which are kind of prima facie obvious. We have pests, uh, we have light, which people don't think of often. Then we have humidity change, temperature change, um, and then finally, custodial neglect. And if you think about all of those 10, the majority of them are surprisingly related to climate change. Things like water, fire, humidity, temperature. While those historically we have understood as being incidental things, there is a, a local flood or there is a local fire, conservators are now having to wrap their heads around the fact that climate change writ large is threatening thousands upon thousands of uh, artworks all over the world. Things, uh, there are whole museums that are going to disappear in 10 years. And within them, tens of thousands of artworks that are cherished and loved and at immediate threat. And so. You know, in this case, this was a particularly violent 
climate incident, a hurricane that kind of took everything. But on a much smaller level, there are museums and collections all over the world that are just not protected against climate change. And so it, it's not just our houses or our parks or our infrastructure that's at threat. It's our, the things that matter to us, our cultural heritage. Now, luckily, you guys were able to get in and salvage it. Uh, and, and there are a couple of acute issues we have. Obviously, the paint layer is incredibly unstable. You can see some of these massive paint losses on the edges. And that's where the canvas expanded when it got wet and then shrunk when it dried, which canvases want to do, but paint can't do that. And so that tension caused a detachment of all of this paint. And then, of course, it flaked off and probably was taken by the water. Uh, we have areas where the paint is, is so perilously attached, it's peeling up areas where the paint has completely detached and, and is flipped over and, and little bits of paint scattered throughout the, the painting. We have lots of grime on the surface, and this is probably a combination of uh, all the grime that was in the house, in the water, and then the residue of the mold that's kind of everywhere on this painting. And we can see it on the front, but on the back, it's probably in the canvas, on the canvas, and saturated the whole area. So there is quite a bit of work that needs to happen to stabilize this painting, to make sure that we can even start handling it. But it's nothing that I haven't seen before, and uh, I'm confident that once it's all put back together, not only will the painting be conserved and restored to how you remember it, but when it leaves here, it will be in better condition than it ever was before and more stable and hopefully better able to weather whatever future climate issues it does face, yeah. you know, provided they're not another Category 4 hurricane. Like Brian, with Walter Lofthouse Dean, I also have an artist in my family, my father. And Brian and I were talking about how to best preserve the artwork aside from conservation. And we came up with the idea that maybe a website would be a great tool. And Squarespace makes that really easy. If you want to document and share the artwork of a friend or even yourself, you can use one of their pre-made templates. They have thousands of them that are mobile friendly and easy to launch with a click of a button. In fact, they have a whole suite for artists to showcase their work. But, you know, maybe you want to have a little bit more creative control. You can build your own custom website with a brand new designed interface. And you can choose everything from the colors, the themes, the fonts, even the photos that are used, and where everything orients. So it can really be a personal testament to the work that you want to showcase. And it really is simple. Though I've sped this video up, it took all of maybe three or four minutes to get this website up and launched. And there it is, preserved for the future. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. This project starts like so many others, by removing the painting from the frame. But unlike many other projects, I can't just flip this one over because, of course, all the paint that is just perilously on the surface will pop off. So I have to do it from the bottom, which isn't terribly difficult. You can see removing these rusted nails doesn't take a huge amount of effort, but it is just an indication that every step of this project is going to be slightly different and slightly unconventional and need a little bit more care than the average painting. But that's fine. That's what we do here. Now, with the painting removed from the frame, I can start to address some of the flaking paint. And I'm going to remove it very, very delicately and place it into this little steel tray. And I'm doing that so that none of this gets lost. Much of this paint is not in its original location, and so I don't have to worry about marking where I'm lifting off these pieces, but I want to save them to see if I can find out where they go. Now, in some cases, the paint is right next to where it flaked off, and I can use my brush, which is dampened with a little bit of water to make it more adhesive, and orient that paint flake back where it belongs, put it back in its home. This is a slow and tedious process. All of these little paint flakes need to be saved. I don't want any more of the original paint to be lost. Much of it is already lost, and though we can address that with retouching, if we can save or salvage some of this paint, that's part of our job. 
even if it is very, very time consuming, very, very slow, and at times incredibly frustrating. I'll make multiple passes until I feel like I've gotten all of the paint that I can removed and all of the paint that I can oriented in its original place. And then I'll move on to the next step, which is facing this painting. I'm going to be using a Japanese mulberry paper, a washi kozo or kozo washi, depending on which way you want to say it. And the reason that I use this mulberry paper is because it has incredible fidelity even when wet. So when I adhere this to the surface of the painting, it's not going to decompose or melt away like tissue paper or newsprint. And that's important because I'm going to have to remove this eventually, and if it does kind of fall apart, then it would be almost impossible to remove. I've torn up little squares because I'm going to be going through and trying to put this on really, really delicately. Now I could certainly use one large sheet of the paper as I have done in the past, but because this paint is so delicate and so fragile, going smaller really does benefit the painting and me in the long run. With a hot fish gelatin glue dissolved in water, I can paint on the adhesive. It'll penetrate through the paper, down onto the paint layer, and bond to the paint layer. Once this is bonded to the paint layer, it will hold all of that really fragile paint in place so that as I handle the painting in the next steps, none of it gets lost. Imagine taking this painting off of the stretcher without this protective and stabilizing layer. Any flexing of the canvas would result in more cracking and flaking of the paint, and that's something that we don't want to do. So this step is really critically important to make sure that we don't lose any more paint. Now sometimes this step is done to protect the painting from handling or other treatments that we may need to do, but here it, it really is much like uh, putting a cast on a fossil before you remove it from the ground. You just want to make sure that if something breaks, it doesn't get lost and it's kept in its original location. So square by square, slowly I will add all of the paper to the face of the painting, making sure that I really, really work it down around those lifting areas of paint. This paper, when wet, conforms really well to a surface like this, which is another reason that I use it. And making sure that it conforms really well to that surface will help keep all of that paint in place as I handle the painting and as the treatments progress. I tell you, this paper is really amazing stuff. It's almost... The fish gelatin takes a couple of hours to dry. Usually I'll leave it for a day or two. And once it's dry, now you can see I can flip the painting over and no paint is lost. Mission accomplished. So now I can take the painting off of the stretcher. And these nails and tacks, they're pretty rusted. You can see that the exposure to the salt water has caused them to really come apart. And some of them just break off when I try to take them out. That's not the end of the world. I can dig them out later, but I want to be careful and remove them as delicately as I can so that I don't damage the canvas any more than it already is damaged. Once I've gotten all of those rusty nails and tacks out, I can lift off the stretcher from the painting. And you'll notice that I do this face down and I remove the stretcher from the painting as opposed to the other way around. I do this because it is just less tension and stress on the canvas. This stretcher is good. We'll clean it and save it and reuse it. But there is a lot of grime and dirt trapped behind this painting. In between the stretcher bar and the canvas, this stuff just kind of accumulates over time. And because it was wet, it's really bonded to the canvas. So I need to take a palette knife and kind of scrape it off. Using the brush was effective in loosening some of it, but some of this is really embedded. And I need to get all of this out and off because it doesn't belong there. Now once I've removed and loosened up most of it, I'll take my small HEPA vacuum and I will start to clean off the surface of this canvas. And I am going to be wearing a particle N95 mask that we've all become so familiar with because there is mold and I don't want any of those spores getting into my lungs. I'll clean my tools and my gloves, and once I'm satisfied, I'll take the painting over to the back in the hot table where I can execute the next treatment. 
Now the hot table is a really great tool and it has multiple purposes. We've seen it used in linings and we've seen it used to relax waves and distortions in canvas. And yes, that's one of the features that I will be employing here is using it to relax the distorted canvas. But I'm also going to be using it to kill any of the mold spores. And I'm gonna do this twice. First here with a slightly dampened blotter paper. That's the white paper that the painting is on. And then later on, but I'll get to that then. By raising the temperature up to about 165 degrees, I can ensure that any of those mold spores that are still active get killed. And while the painting is on the hot table, I can use any number of tools, a brayer, a bone folder, or a piece of soft balsa wood to encourage some of that flaking paint to lay down flat. After the painting has been brought up to temperature and allowed to sit, I'll turn off the heat, cool the table, and then when it's room temperature, I can turn off the vacuum pump and remove the painting from its mylar envelope. Now this painting is a little bit damp. There was a little bit of water on that blotter paper to encourage the canvas to soften up. And if I don't press the painting, it's just going to distort. And in that distortion, all of that paint is gonna flake off again. So I'm gonna transfer it over to this table cover it with felt to protect that impasto. Even though there isn't a ton of it, it does make a difference. It also helps distribute the pressure more evenly. And then I'll lower the other two sheets of drip gypsum. And I use drywall or gypsum board because it absorbs ambient moisture really well. After pressing the painting for a couple of days, I can then remove the felt and take the painting for next treatments. You can see that the painting is flat and its relative humidity is that of the studio, so it's not going to distort. I'm laying the painting face down here for the next treatment, which is an adhesive impregnation. Now that paint is still flaking, and if I took off that Japanese mulberry paper, a lot of it would come off. So I'm going to saturate the back of this canvas with a thermoplastic heat activated and solvent activated adhesive. It's thinned out so that it penetrates into the canvas through all the nooks and crannies and up to the surface of the painting. Then I'm gonna let this dry, let some of the solvent evaporate, and then I'll take it over to the hot table to execute the impregnation treatment. Once it's dry, I can then lay this painting onto the hot table, face up, I want the back of the painting against the aluminum, and sandwich it in between two siliconized pieces of mylar film. And that's just going to mean that it's not going to stick. I'll bring the table back up to temperature, again, a high enough temperature to not only activate the thermoplastic adhesive, but to also kill any mold spores that didn't get killed the first time. I'll suck out the air using the vacuum pump and create pressure down on the painting. Once that's done, I can remove the painting from the hot table and begin removing that facing that I spent so much time delicately applying. Now the nice thing about using the fish gelatin is that because it is water-based, I can use water to soften it up. Simply applying a little bit of water to a square, letting it soak in and swell the fish gelatin, I can come back with a palette knife and I can begin removing it. I'm being careful here on the edges because I just want to make sure I don't remove any of the paint. Now once I get a good purchase on this and I get enough off, I can start to peel it back more slowly, but initially it's always good to go slow. Now you can see none of the paint is coming off. It's all been bonded back down to the canvas, which is precisely what we wanted. Now if I hadn't done that impregnation, all of that flaking paint would be stuck to the paper and I'd be peeling it off and it would be a catastrophe. So this is an example of why the impregnation was critically important because now we're not gonna lose any more paint, any more of that paint that was so delicately attached that you know, if you sneezed at it, maybe looked at it the wrong way, it would have all flaked off. Now I mentioned that this paper is really remarkable stuff, and unfortunately this is the end of the road for it. I can't save it, but one thing that it is doing that is of benefit to me, again demonstrating how awesome it is, is combined with the fish gelatin, it's pulling off a lot of that surface grime that was sitting on the surface of the painting. So not only did it protect the painting, stabilize it, but it's actually helping clean it. I'm telling you, mulberry paper is the winner here. Now at this stage, I can turn my attention to all of those little pieces of flaking paint that I 
picked off in the beginning. I've saved them, and I'm taking a conservation adhesive, and I'm applying it directly to the canvas in the areas that I remember and have noted where I picked off those little flakes. Then, using a tweezer and moving very carefully, because this is just fragile, brittle paint, there's nothing here but paint, I'm placing them where I believe that they go. Now, obviously some of these are gonna line up perfectly because I remember where they go and it's clear, and some may not, but that's a risk we have to take. A little piece of siliconized film and then a little steel shot filled weight just to press it while the adhesive dries. And I'll go through and make multiple passes and do this multiple times to make sure that I get all of those little pieces bonded back down to the canvas where they belong. After allowing the adhesive to dry for a day, I can come back and remove all these little bean bags, and I can check to see how the work turned out. And luckily for me, everything worked exactly as I had hoped. All those little flakes are bonded back down to the canvas. So now it is time to start cleaning this painting of the surface grime and old varnish and dust and dirt and all that stuff that happened during the hurricane. I'm using a neutral organic soap here, which is going to break down all of that grime that's on the surface. This won't remove the varnish, but it will remove all of that gunk. I apply it with a brush, and then I agitate it a little bit with that brush, and that helps break up the thick layer of grime. Now, this brush is a soft bristle brush, so it's not really doing any damage to the painting, but it's agitating it enough that it helps lift up some of that grime. And you can see just how effective it is at loosening up all of that stuff. Now, once I've agitated it enough, and I'm confident that I can't really agitate it anymore to any benefit, I can come back with a cotton ball and I can lift off all of that grime-filled soap. And you can see just how much of a difference it really is. But that's all the cleaning you're going to get to see. You'll have to tune in next time to see what happens when I fully clean the painting and the results of all of the work yet to come.